Tonight, I want you to get ready for the word. Are you ready for the word? Are you hungry? Do we, I want to no, know, I want, no, you're hungry for the word. Just put faith on that in Jesus' name. And I want to ask you too, even as the word is being uh, delivered, one of the things that we do at the ramp is, is we make the word a big deal. So I mean, even just posture, even response. I don't, I, you know, when the, when the man of God is bringing the word of God, I always tell chosen, even our posture sits on the edge of our seat. We are hungry. We are eager. And I found out something from having preached many times myself, people who want the word, people who receive it with faith, pull an unction from you. They will pull the anointing that's in the minister out. It makes the flow of the anointing. It just makes it so much easier to deliver the word when that unction is just being released because people in the audience are saying, I want that. I'll take that. I'm hungry for that. I believe that. I agree with that. Okay? So listen, your response matters. Your faith matters. Now I want to ask you one more time as we bring the man of God to the pulpit. I want you by faith to welcome Pastor Casey Doss. A man I love very dearly. My son. Come on, just welcome him tonight. And let, let the Lord know. And Pastor Casey, I'm ready for the word. Go ahead. Somebody give Jesus a praise. Come on, Ram. Give Jesus a praise. Lift your voice and give him some glory. Father, we bless you tonight and we thank you. And we glorify you. And everybody said, roll tide. You can be seated. It is so uh, awesome to, uh, to get to be here with you. I've been looking forward to it. I found out uh, last week that I would, I would be doing this, and so I'm really excited to be here. We are up in Knoxville doing our thing, but I'm, I've made it a point to come down here as much as I can, not to preach, just to come and, and be a part. But before we get in the Word, I, I, I think it would only be right uh, to give honor where honor is due and thank God for the man and the woman of God whose faith and patience and fight built this whole building for a generation to be reached. Would you thank God for Perry and Pam Stone? Stand on your feet and thank God for Perry and Pam Stone. I love you, sir. I love you deep. These monitors are sounding a little weird. These monitors are sounding a little... Okay. It's always, uh, I would say, fun preaching in front of Perry, but it's not very much fun. I had a week to prepare this sermon, and in that week, he wrote three books, flew to Israel probably four times, held a conference, created some teaching series, and uh, created a Bible translation. Who, who knows what happened, but here I am with my little sermon. And I also want to give honor to, uh, to my mama, Mother Karen. We call her Miss Karen for her faith. I don't think you realize what a price it is for her to make this trip every single week only because she believes in reaching a generation in East Tennessee. So would you thank God for Mama Karen? And for Lauren Bentley and for Samuel Bentley and the team that God has sent here to help us shake East Tennessee. In Jesus' name. All right, now I got a crew from Knoxville with me. Holler at me. Holler at me. There you are. Woo! So I brought my own friends just in case things went sideways. Grab your Bible. Go with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 2. Uh, the book of Acts, chapter number 2. And uh, I'm going to read two passages to you, Acts chapter 2. I'm going to start reading with verse number 1. If you didn't bring your Bible, just look up here on the screen. Acts 2, verse number 1 records these words. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Right? That's our, that's our that's Pentecostals. That's our verse. Glory to God. Divided tongues. We don't know any other verse in the Bible, but bless God in the upper room. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages 
as the Spirit gave them ability. Does anybody still believe in the baptism in the Holy Ghost? Now, there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at this sound, the crowd was gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, yeah, 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 yeah. All right, jump down to verse 11. Cretans and Arabs, in our own languages, we hear them speaking about the good deeds of God's power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying one to another, what does this mean? Say that with me. What does this mean? All together now. What does this mean? What does this mean? Jump over to verse 37. You know the story. Peter preaches his sermon in just a handful of verses. He tells them all they're going to hell. They get ready to repent. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? What does this mean? And what do we do? With what this means. What does this mean? And what do we do? With what this means. Peter said to them. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. So that your sins may be forgiven. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you. For your children. And to all who are far away. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to him. And he testified with many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who, were, so those who welcomed his message were baptized, and that day were added about 3,000 persons. They devoted themselves, watch verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers. All came upon everyone, because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and good goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all of the people and day by day the Lord added to their number those who were being saved everybody said amen. amen what does this mean and what do we do with what this means whenever we think or talk about God we have to make sure that we are thinking and talking about God rightly there's so many times that we speak about God and think about God in ways that are unworthy of him. If you don't believe me, I can send you some Facebook posts that I saw today. And you'll say, man, all of that's wrong. <laughs> when we think about God and when we speak about God, we have to make sure that we're talking about him rightly. And before I get deep into this, I want to I set up two Two foundational pillars for us understanding God. The first thing that we have to say about God is we have to say that God is against sin and evil. I figured I'd get a big amen up in Cleveland, Tennessee. Glory to God. God is against sin. God is against evil. God is against sin in all of its manifestations. But God is for us. God is against sin, but God is for us. And God is against sin, not because of what sin does to him. God is against sin because of what sin does to us. We are called as, his, as human beings to be his image bearers. That is our calling. That is our purpose, to reflect the nature of God into the world. And sin distorts and blurs and breaks that image of God on the inside of us. God is against sin, not because sin offends him. God doesn't get offended. God can't get offended. God doesn't have ego. God is humble. 
Can we talk about God for a minute? God is the infinite transcendent amount of everything he asked us to be. So if God is humble, he is infinite humility, and we are being made and fashioned into his likeness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So God, is not, God is against sin, not because it offends him, but because it dehumanizes us. It destroys us in the worst of ways. It changes us in the worst of ways. Can we say those two things? God is against sin, but God is for us. As a matter of fact, and, and, and hear me before, before I complete, let me complete this statement before you tell me that I'm wrong. You were not created for a purpose. You have a purpose. Don't misunderstand me. You have a purpose, but you were not created for a purpose. You and I were created out of the sheer abundance of the divine love nature of who God is. You have a purpose, but God did not create you for that reason. We are created because God was not interested in being God without me and you. I have three children. My three children were not, were not created because I needed them to do something. So far, all they've done is spend all my money and destroy my house. My children were created not because I needed something from them. They were the outgrowth of a love relationship me and my wife already had established. You and I were not created for a purpose. You and I are the outgrowth of a love relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. I'm telling you, church, God is better than we think he is. Is anybody tonight thankful for the goodness of God? We are his image bearers. We are to reflect him into the world. That's what it means to be human. I promise I'm getting to Acts in just a second. That's what it means to be human. It means that we reflect him, that we image him forth into the world. God does not need to get rid of you in order to use you. You are fully you when God is most fully using you. You hear, is this too theological? Right? I am most fully myself when God is most fully at work in my life. That's the difference. Maybe I'm getting too far. That's the difference between the demonic and the holy. The demonic possesses. The demonic dispossesses. The demonic edges us out. He fills up our life in such a way that he edges us out. But God does not dispossess us. God fulfills us. I, can, I should have preached this. I should have preached this at RSM. We are most fully ourselves when God is most fully at work in us. That's why service to God is actually freedom. Because that's when we are most fully us. That's why when we are bound to him, that is when we are the most liberated. That's why when we submit to him, that's when we really begin to step into our authority. Because we are most fully us when God is most fully at work in us. That's why holiness is not the price we pay for serving God. Holiness is our purpose. To be like him. Can I get a witness from somebody? I'm telling you, friend, God is better than we have preached and better than we have talked. We have talked about him in ways that are unworthy of him. And we preach holiness as though God's commands come to violate us and to break us. They don't come to violate us and to break us. They come to make us fully who we were called to be. St. Augustine said it this way. He said, God... Give me what you will. Give me what you command and then command whatever you will. Give me everything I need and then ask of me anything you want. Because when we are most holy, that is when we are most fully us. That's why holiness matters. You hearing what I'm saying? So we get over into, naturally, we get over into the book of Acts. After all of that. And you read this story that they're the two most difficult kinds of text to preach ever is the text that nobody's familiar with. Because then you have to familiarize them with the text. 
Say I were to extract a verse from Lamentations chapter 4. It's been a minute since you read that, let's be honest. It'd take a minute to figure out what in the world he's talking about. The most difficult text to preach from is the text that nobody's familiar with. Amen, brother. Glory to God. The second most difficult text to preach from is the text that everybody's familiar with. Because we think we've mined everything out of that that there is to mine. That's why when he preached to Pentecostals about Acts chapter 2, that's our verse. We got that one. You memorized that back in 82 at the camp meeting. But there's more going on inside the text than we realize. There's more happening in the text that we realize. Can we talk about it for just a minute? Your Bible is constructed in such a way that it is, and I preach this all the time, I've got to get this into you. The Bible is constructed in such a way that it is telling one story. It was written by different authors in different eras and time periods and this, that, and the other. And you can debate this, that, and the other, but it's really telling one story. And from Genesis to Revelation, that one story is connected. When you get into the New Testament, you see little hints and little echoes of everything that the Old Testament was talking about. When you get into the book of Revelation, everybody's favorite book right now because of COVID. When you get to the book of Revelation, you start reading about the tree of life and a river that flows from the throne of God. John didn't just start pinning a beautiful picture of the eschaton. John is remembering what he read all the way back in the book of Genesis and the same tree that Moses saw is now the same tree that John is seeing in his vision because the Bible all fits together. That's why when Jesus in the book of Matthew, when Jesus goes down into Egypt because Herod is about to kill everybody, Matthew the gospel writer makes this statement he says out of Egypt I have called my son and we read right past that just yep boom. and we don't understand how it connects out of Egypt I had called my I have called my son so now your mind has to race all the way back to when Israel was in Egypt and God called them out of Egypt then God sent them through the waters of the Dead Sea and then God sent them into their temptation in the wilderness where they fell but when you get over into Matthew's gospel, you read about Jesus being called out of Egypt. And now he's going through his own waters, which is the waters of John's baptism. And now he's going to go into his own wilderness where he's going to win the victory for us because it all fits together. That's why when you read about 12 apostles, Jesus walking around with 12 apostles, your mind has to go all the way back to the book of Genesis. When God starts telling Abraham, I'm going to raise up some sons and a family out of you that's going to bless the earth. You hearing what I'm saying? Talk back to me, Graham. Talk back to me. You hear what I'm saying? Your mind has to go there. And then you have to start digging. What is Jesus getting at? Was 12 the magical number? Was there something super spiritual about the number 12? He is connecting it to the story of Abraham. Because when Adam and Eve fell in the garden, the earth was cursed. Right? That's not a trick Bible question. The earth was cursed, right? And then God begins the process of breaking the curse with Abraham. And he says, through you, all of the earth is going to be, what's the opposite of cursed? Through you, all of the world is going to be blessed. Through you, I'm going to break and undo the curse of Adam. Now Jesus shows up on the scene and he's got 12 apostles around him, just like Abraham had 12 tribes around him. And the work that God started in Abraham now gets, it finds its fullness and its fulfillment in Jesus and his 12 apostles. Now this work of new creation has officially launched. If y'all can keep up with Perry, I know you can keep up with this. I've studied the Bible my whole life. And when Perry starts talking about Teshuvah, I'm like, preach, brother. I've never heard that word, but it sounds so good. 
He started talking about the Jewish feast. I just shake my head. I, was, I went to Israel one time with Barry. And I found a McDonald's in Galilee. And I ran like Forrest Gump to the Golden Arches. Because if I ate another piece of pita bread with hummus on it, I was going to go smooth off. As you can tell, diet is not a core value of mine. This is how it all, this is how it all fits together. That Abraham was going to remove the curse out of 12 tribes of Israel. And now Jesus shows up with 12 new tribes to fully, finally complete what Abraham had launched. And then you read about them being in an upper room and there's a sound from heaven. They're in an upper room. They're in, they're in a, they're in an elevated place. There's a sound from heaven and there's a new tongue that comes. I remember reading about an upper room over in Genesis where God has to come down and confound the languages called the Tower of Babel but now what God did and Babel God is remaking all things new in this upper room he had to confound the nations but now he's bringing them all together to make an announcement that Jesus has conquered death hell in the grave and we're going to pronounce the good news what does this mean this means that when Jesus came on the earth he was not listen 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 his purpose his purpose was not just to die on the cross that was his purpose, but that was not his only purpose. He says something profound, profound in the gospel of Luke. This always bothered me. There's a, there's a, there's a passage in Luke chapter 9, verse number 1. Jesus says this. He looks at his disciples and he says, I give you power and authority over all devils. That's a good Pentecostal verse. Whoa, glory. I give you power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. Luke chapter number 10, he says, I give you power and authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you because I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven but don't rejoice in this that the devils are subject to you. Rejoice that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. But in Luke chapter 9, Jesus says, I give you power and authority over all devils and to cure diseases. And then about 40 verses later, Luke had a lot to say. About 40 verses later, Luke tells a story of a man whose son was throwing himself into the fire and throwing himself into the water back and forth. Jesus had just told his disciples I've given you the power to break this. Now they get to test it out. <laughs> Just like God, your first day on the job, a demon-possessed person shows up. <laughs> He's not praying for the sniffles. This dude's throwing himself into the fire. This is college-level education. He says, I brought my boy. Imagine the pain. Imagine the heartbreak. I brought my boy to your disciples because I need some help because me and his mama have tried everything and they couldn't cast him out. And Jesus says something hilarious. It's in the King, I like the King James Bible. How long do I have to suffer with you? He didn't call it, how long do I have to walk with you? How much do you need to be taught? How long do I have to suffer with you? Bring the boy to me. This is what Jesus is teaching. Jesus was not on the earth ministering for 33 and a half years because there's something magical about the number 33 and a half. Jesus could have left prior to 33 and a half. It took the disciples that long to catch it. 
How long am I going to have to suffer with you? Because my purpose is not just to come and die on the cross. My purpose is to raise up sons of God that can do what the Son of God is doing. That's why he said the works that I do, you will do, and greater works than these shall you do. That's why he said the glory of the latter house will be greater than the glory of the former house. Before Jesus dies on the cross, he is called the only begotten son of God. After he dies on the cross, he is never referred to again as the only begotten son of God. Now he is the first begotten son of God. Because when Jesus was on the earth, the devil had one son that was healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead, and casting out devils. But now that he sent the Holy Ghost, he's got hundreds... He's got hundreds of thousands of sons. Is there anybody baptized in that same spirit that raised up Jesus from the dead? Oh, I need somebody to stand up on your feet and give God a shout if you've been endued with power from on high. Now the devil doesn't have one son of God healing the sick, cleansing the leper, raising the dead, casting out devils. Now there's an entire auditorium in Cleveland, Tennessee, healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the leper, casting out devils. What does this mean? This is what it means. That the Holy Ghost did not come on you just so you could and show off to your Baptist friend. The Holy Ghost came upon you because there's a campus that needs revival in Cleveland, Tennessee. I feel the Holy Ghost. God, the Holy Ghost came upon us because there's a campus called UT Chattanooga that needs God to break in. The Holy Ghost is on us because there's a campus called UT Knoxville that needs the Holy Ghost to shake it to its very foundations. The ramp is not here because Perry got tired of ministry. The ramp is here because God was tying three ministries together to shake a region. What does this mean? This means that the sons of God are ready to manifest themselves. What does this mean? This means that the whole earth is groaning and travailing, waiting for you to show up. That's what this means. The ramp is not here so God can use us. The ramp is here so God can use all of us. You are way past time where you need to be babysat and taught and pampered and catered to. We're here to raise up an army baptized in the spirit that's ready to shake the kingdom of darkness. We want to go after God and go after this city. I want God to burn in your belly. I want the fire of God to burn in you like never before. I believe there's going to be some moments trapped in his presence in this room that's unlike anything we've ever seen. But I don't just think we're called to go after God. I think we're called to go after some cities. I think we're called to go after some campuses. Uh, Can I get an amen from somebody? You are not filled with the Holy Ghost. So you and your buddies can just lay hands on each other and y'all fall out. Uh, You are filled with the Holy Ghost because that is the power you need to break every chain. What does this mean? My man. What does this mean? This means there's not just one son of God. There's the sons of God. I get so weary when I hear like, well, Jesus is just going to have to fix it. He is going to fix it through you and through me. Lord, just get me out of the way. He don't need to get you out of the way. He needs to get you fully in the place where you belong, being who you are in all of your glory and fullness. What does this mean? This means that we believe God wants to move in an unprecedented way. And I am not one of those preachers that stands up every week and says, Revival's coming, revival's coming. I'm not with no, no, no. 
I remember when, when I found out the ramp was coming here. I got, I got off the phone with Miss Karen, and I was just elated, thinking, God, what are you doing? We moved to Knoxville three years ago. My, my brother, Andrew Tao, is in Chattanooga. And I remember standing at a conference in Cleveland, Tennessee, at North Cleveland Church of God. And I was in my mid-20s. I just had a baby. I was trying to figure out how to change a diaper. I wasn't worried about revival. <laughs> and I remember a man of God standing up in North Cleveland Church of God. And he prophesied a highway of fire stretching from Chattanooga all the way to Knoxville, Tennessee. Can we believe that I-75, that I-40 in Knoxville will be filled with the fire of God. What does this mean? It means that you are here to be a fully mature. It means you are here to be a fully mature son of God. It doesn't mean, great, Karen and them's coming. And we've always loved her music. And I hope you have. I've enjoyed her music as well. It means I believe God is doing something that we don't even have the right language for. That's what we, we have a prayer meeting at our church at 9 a.m. Every, every, every other Saturday. And we were praying this morning and we said, what we believe God's doing we don't even have the words for it. It's just a groan that God's got to interpret for us. What does this mean? That's what it means. Now, what do we do with what this means? And your Bible makes it clear. They gave themselves they gave themselves to prayer. They gave themselves to the word. They gave themselves to community and to relationship. It's easy in a room this size with this many people to have a spectator mentality. Come in, Eddie's going to lead worship. This is going to be crazy. Everybody already knows. So we're going to come in. Glory to God. This is Goldie. Goldie goes to my church. Goldie's one of the most godly people in the world. Give it up for Goldie. <clears throat> That's why, and I, and I want to say this with the right spirit. I really do. That's why 45-minute drive through church doesn't work for us. Right? That's why the ramp can't do. You can't do this four times on Sunday. I don't care how young you are. Glory. You can't do this four times on Sunday. I don't care how long of a break you got. You have to mainline caffeine into your veins for the IV drip. What does this mean? It means that we believe God wants to do something outrageous in East Tennessee. What do we do with this? With what this means? It means we have to give ourselves to it. In prayer, in the word, and in community. I'm not the leader here, but I feel like I can speak on their behalf. We're not trying to grow a church. We're trying to form a fiery community. We're not trying to grow a church. We're trying to build a family that can burn together, that can run together, that can win a generation together. We're not trying to build a church. We're not trying to build a church. We're trying to form a family and a community in one heart and one mind and one accord. That's the problem with so many of our churches. You have about as much relationship as the people you go to church with as people you go to the mall with. And we call that a church. So what do we do? We give ourselves to it. If I can drive an hour, 
You can drive 10 minutes. We give ourselves to it. If I can fight Knoxville traffic, you can fight that Cleveland traffic. We give ourselves to it. Sometimes I wonder, though, in all of our preaching, in all of our church, if we're really ready to handle the brokenness of people that needs healed. Because a bunch of college students ain't going to look like us. They ain't going to act like us. They ain't going to smell. They for sure ain't going to think like us. You know, the, I, I preached a, a series a while back at my church called The Bible Never Said That. The Bible never said that. The Bible didn't tell you so. And one of the things we preached about was this. You ever heard that statement? Love the sinner, hate the sin. You heard that? Love that we say that all the time. Love the sinner, hate the sin. The Bible didn't say that. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible does not say love the sinner, hate the sin. The Bible says love your neighbor. And when we view them as sinners, instead of people, they become projects instead of humans that God wants to transform. And we hate sin, not because, ooh, sin. We hate sin because exactly what it is doing to them. Jesus never recoiled from the brokenness of anybody. Jesus had a prostitute massaging his feet over dinner. Jesus never recoiled from people's brokenness. Jesus moved towards people's brokenness. And to the degree that we recoil from them is to the degree that we are unlike him. To the degree that we recoil from the 19-year-old college student who doesn't know if they're male or female. To the degree that we recoil from the 21-year-old college student that doesn't know if they're gay or straight. To the degree that we recoil from them is to the degree that we are un-Christian. We love our neighbor. And we hate sin because of what sin is doing to our neighbor. You hearing what I'm saying? They're not projects that we preach to so we can carve another notch in our belt and pat ourselves on the back and say, I witness for Jesus today. They're not a project. They're a person with a calling and a purpose and they're broken and they're wounded and sin has devastated them and we believe that we've got everything you need to become fully the person that God's called you to become. Come on, Eddie. Or whoever's leading worship. This is not how I intended on ending this, but here we are. Let me say this to you. To the degree, me and, me and Brother Eddie was just talking about this right before I came up here. To the degree that we recoil from them is to the degree that we are unlike him. Right? Now watch. There's a story in your Bible in Luke. When Jesus is sitting at a table and he's sitting with the Bible says, tax collectors and sinners. Another translation says, the flagrantly wicked. I don't mean people that said a bad word every once in a while. I mean the wicked. When it says he was sitting with tax collectors, Rome used people in local areas to exact taxes from its citizens and they would charge more so they could make themselves rich and break the backs of the oppressed. And Jesus is sitting at the table with these broken, greedy, corrupt businessmen. He is sitting at a table with prostitutes. He is sitting at a table and the Pharisees, y'all can stand up. 
And the Pharisees look at him and say, if this man knew who he was talking to, he would not let them be in his presence. And then Jesus makes a staggering statement. Those that are healthy don't need a doctor. But those that are sick, I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call sinners to repentance. He called them to repentance at a table. And if we won't invite them to our tables, they'll never come to our altars. Stand up on your feet. If we're so holy, if we're so sanctified, that we can't have them at our table, they'll never come to our altar. And uh, please hear me. I, I hope I don't have to make this same. I'm not condoning sin. My opening statement was, God is against sin. Right? And we are against sin. For the very same reason that God is against it. Because of what it is doing to our neighbor. There are college students going to a Christian university tonight. Trapped and bound in destruction. There are students at UT trapped and bound in destruction. There are people in the youth groups of churches all over this city. Trapped and bound in destruction. He sent the sons of God with the power of his spirit to break every chain. But that won't happen if we blow in, give him a praise, and blow out. We have to give ourselves to this. Can I tell you a little secret? How many of you have been to the ramp in Hamilton? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise it high. Raise it high. Put your hand down. How many of you have not been to the ramp in Hamilton? Unacceptable. How many of you have been to a ramp conference in this building? Raise your hand. How many of you have not? Bunch of reprobates. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm going to tell you a little secret to what God's doing and has been doing in Ramp Hamilton. It's not just because there's awesome leaders there and there are awesome leaders there. It's not just because there's powerful preachers there and there are powerful preachers there. It's not just because there's great worship there and there is great worship there. All of those things are true. But part of the secret sauce that makes it what it is is there's a community of people that never get on a platform and never hold a microphone, but was gripped with a vision for changing a generation. And they've given themselves to it. They've given themselves to it. If you ever say Cleveland's a small town, I'm going to choke you out. <laughs> Cleveland is not a small town. They've sold their businesses. They've pulled their kids out of school. They've sold their dream houses and moved across the country to give themselves to something. What does this mean? And then what do we do with what this means? We give ourselves to it. And I know I'm not talking to everybody in here. But I am talking to somebody. That says well, the vision of this house burns in my belly and I'm ready to give myself to it. That's what it means. Lift your hands to the